Hello, friends, and welcome to Radio Free Cannabis. Coming to you from high in the hills of Oakland, California, we are the voice of the global cannabis freedom movement. Just a reminder, we are translated into 195 different languages via the YouTube auto-translate function. And a quick shout out to my good friends at Okayama Denim, who have uh, sent me this very beautiful natural indigo dyed sashiko shirt. Thank you. You know, uh, when I was a young little baby hippie, around 50 years ago now, I was doing a lot of searching and a lot of seeking. And that searching and seeking often took me into different kinds of hippie outposts, uh, households, crash pads, communes, festivals. And one of the things that, that I ran into over and over again was in whatever kind of washing setup there was, mm -hmm. was a jar of Dr. Bronner's soap. It was usually a really big jar and it was usually peppermint flavor. And we hippies loved Doc Bronner's soap because it was clean and pure and natural and it was really inexpensive and we could use it for almost everything. So it fit with our simple, natural kind of lifestyle. We didn't know quite what to make of the labeling, which in one hand sort of evoked the all one love philosophy we believed in, but also had a lot of biblical references. Um, but um, uh, we did love the Doc Bronner soap. Uh, it's not soap, though, that I was looking for in all of those communes and crash pads. What I was seeking was a lifestyle, a way of making myself through the world, providing for a living that would be consistent with my value system, which had already been informed by the use of cannabis and other visionary plants and substances. And it was a bit of a desperate search for me because as I looked on all the career options that were available to me, and they all involved in some way uh, destroying the planet or exploiting people. And I, in good conscience, I just, I didn't know how I could do it. Um, but I was reaching the age where I'd have to start providing for myself. And that's how I found cannabis. Um, of course, it was underground. It was the underground market for cannabis. And for most of my life, that's how I made my way. It allowed me to provide for my family and at the same time spread this good healing plant around the world. But it was also a bit of a brutal lifestyle. It was underground. It was very gangstery. Um, there were times when I lost friends. They were arrested. They were put on trial. They went to prison. The same thing happened to me. Um, you would get ripped off. Uh, you would get betrayed. Uh, you would lose friends to acts of violence. And so it's not really a lifestyle that, that I could recommend to most young people. So I was thrilled in 2006 when the city of Oakland, California became the first jurisdiction anywhere in the world in the modern era to license legal cannabis businesses because I thought that it would offer a hope for me and, and hopefully for many other people coming behind me to be able to have a legal career, not a desperate gangster career, but still be able to live consistent with our values and, and move this plant around the world and introduce her to all the people who need it. Well, I think in the years since then, we've learned that the legal cannabis industry has mixed results in, in that regard. Um, but we're very lucky to have with us here today, one of the people who's really been most successful at negotiating that tricky balance of uh, a successful business um, that is also conducted in line with the value system that I think all of us, or at least most of us on this podcast share. So please join me in welcoming my, my dear friend, uh, CEO of Doc Bronner's and CEO and Doc Bronner's, that is the Cosmic Engagement Officer, David Bronner. David, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Steve. Honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. David, um, I'm going to spend some time exploring your personal journey. But before we get there, if you could just tell us about some of the major business projects that you've got going on here today so we can understand the, the breadth of your, of your reach. Yeah. 
Um, you know, just quickly, I know we'll be diving into it uh, uh, in more depth here, but um, definitely that, you know, activist passion first. I mean, my granddad had it, Dr. Bronner, and I, you know, in Amsterdam and that, you know, to explore it, but having that passion first to, to, to help the world and then, you know, figuring out how you can do that and leverage business as a progressive engine of, of social and environmental change to do that. Um, and, you know, and then approaching, like, of course, you need to generate profits to, to be able to accomplish your mission, but that those profits being in service to that higher mission, that's, that's the crucial, crucial deal that unfortunately, uh, all too many people lose sight of, uh, and um, yeah, so if we can see some uh, entrepreneurs and, and cannabis businesses get big that have that right ethic and are in service to, to spirit, um, that's, that's the game. I mean, that's what's gonna change the world. Um, so of course, Dr. Bronner's, that's um, our, our, our main, uh, main engine. Uh, my granddad founded the company as a nonprofit religious organization to the Unite Spaceship Earth and All One God Faith that all faith traditions were pointing at that same transcendent mystery and when approached with humility, humbleness and respect, they all open you to that, that source energy, that love, that light at the heart of existence in the midst of the suffering and absurdity. And that if we idolize, make idols out of our beliefs and, you know, and, and they close down to source and then we're like fighting each other over who's God's bigger and, and all, all the ridiculousness that that results in, you know, my granddad saw that the next Holocaust in the nuclear armed world was gonna, we're gonna all perish. So, uh, you know, he, he, that was what he was all about, the soaps, his natural soap recipes. Uh, he himself was a third generation master soap maker from a German Jewish soap making family. For him was really the vehicle for his message. The label was really not there to sell the soap, but the soap was there to sell the, the label, the message. And it was pretty genius. Uh, you know, he realized people were coming to hear him speak to get this, you know, word of God out. This is pretty gosh darn dang good soap. So people were coming to get the soap without listening to what he had to say. So then he put the, the, his message on the label, uh, you know, Thomas Paine style, and you're in the bathroom, you forgot a magazine and, and he's got you. And it's just, uh, you know, just really, really beautiful and, and incredible example and inheritance and gift. Um, and, you know, the IRS disagreed with his uh, tax exempt uh, self-designated status and, uh, in the late 80s, we, we were in bankruptcy and we reorganized as a for-profit uh, and exited. My dad at that point uh, entered the picture and he, he had, I grew up working with my dad in a whole separate business. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, but he, with, when my dad, granted I got Parkinson's, my dad and my mom and my uncle uh, kind of came in, kind of fired some bad advisors my granddad had, reorganized the company as a for-profit and we exited bankruptcy. But with that nonprofit DNA at the heart of our, our mission. And um, so we're basically a social venture and we're now organized as a benefit corporation under California law, which is somewhat of a hybrid. Um, it uh, enables us, uh, well, I mean, it's not that different from a, a regular CRS corp, um, but it basically enables us to do what we want with our profits to the benefit of the world, uh, instead of just maximizing uh, shareholder return. You know, that's generally a, the fiduciary responsibility of a C corp under American law is like, that's your one and sole purpose, but a benefit corp, it allows us to have other purposes such as uh, integrating our psych psychedelic and, and cannabis sacraments as responsibly and as fast as possible. And, and even if we brought on shareholders, they couldn't sue us for doing that. Um, so it's a, it's a great hybrid form. The, the other uh, relevant uh, uh, company is brother David's. It's a, a, a not to wholly nonprofit owned, um, and it's basically exists to promote Sun and Earth certification. Um, got my hat right over here. I should probably be wearing my Sun and Earth, Sun and Earth hat. So my, my, so this is a, a new certification um, in the cannabis space, and I think um, you you know uniquely appreciate that. I think we were all so focused on ending cannabis prohibition and, and stopping the, the shredding of people's lives and families, uh, you know, with this, you know, racist out of control war on drugs and war on cannabis. And, you know, we're so focused on ending it, we weren't paying as much attention as maybe we should have been to the, what legalization would look like. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, I think maybe I was naively thinking that cannabis would be somehow uniquely different and more higher vibration uh, than other, uh, you know, industrial sectors. 
but unfortunately we're kind of seeing that same unconscious profit maximizing corporatizing influence coming into cannabis space in a, in a really big way. And especially the small family craft farmers who've been supplying cannabis, a, a lot of these families and farms, they, they're back to land, you know, hippie farmers, pine, organic pioneers, figuring out how to grow not just cannabis, but our fruits and vegetables and the food we need to eat in a totally regenerative and organic way, not on the synthetic pesticide treadmill. And, um, you know, there's this vibrant, beautiful way of life um, is now just being completely, it's a catastrophe with these huge corporate indoor grows coming in and, um, uh, you know, the regulations are just so burdensome for the small family farmer. And because of federal prohibition, you can't access the organic program, uh, which has its own set of problems, but, um, but because of the, the term organic is federally regulated, you can't certify cannabis organic. So Sun and Earth is uh, basically a high bar certification standard. Macy means cannabis is grown in the soil under the sun, no chemicals with fair labor practices. Um, and, uh, and Brother David's is, a, a, you know, we're kind of strategizing, well, you know, we, we help bring together a really diverse stakeholder group of farmers and uh, to, to figure out the standards, but then how do we communicate to the bud, to the trade and to consumers? And so we realized that launching a nonprofit brand platform um, and making a nonprofit, so it's clear that we're not trying to maximize profit here at all, um, but just to be a vehicle to communicate sun and earth to bud tenders, to consumers. And, and, and we want to see all, all other cannabis brands source sun and earth. Um, this isn't about, uh, you know, we want to be like Intel Inside or USD Organic. This, the whole project is to promote sun and earth certification to the benefit of, you know, small craft cannabis farmers. And so those are the two main, well, and there's another analogous effort, Regen, regenerative organic, regenorganic.org. This is a, an effort I'm on the board that's um, uh, working in the, just everything that's not cannabis space to bring fair labor, high animal welfare standards and ISO health standards uh, and build on the organic program. So that's launching right now. Um, we're partnered with Patagonia. And then finally, I'm on the board of MAPS and, uh, and we, you know, we formed a, uh, a wholly owned uh, for-profit subsidiary, but owned by the nonprofit. Um, basically it's a, a nonprofit pharma uh, company and we're bringing MDMA through FDA approval process uh, uh, for treatment resistant PTSD initially, but that'll break the gates wide open for psychedelic medicine generally and then have MAPS be this kind of ethical engine, uh, you know, unlike a lot of the for-profits will have that ethos and stay true to the, to the, you know, source mission. Yeah. Wow, man. Uh, what, what a breadth of activity that you're engaged in. And, and, you know, it's just so striking to me that the thread that runs through it all is this dedication to values based business. Um, could you talk to us just a little bit about Sun and Earth and what makes Sun and Earth certified cannabis different from other cannabis? Yeah, um, so, so as mentioned, uh, you know, unfortunately the regulations in California and elsewhere tend to favor large corporate grows. That tend, a lot of them are indoor and just consuming a lot of fossil fuel energy. Uh, to drive the lights. I mean, I think it's something like 1% of energy demand in the States right now. It's because of uh, cannabis. Um, and, you know, and often it's very chemical, uh, you know, chemical, for, for, you know, relies on chemical fertility, a lot of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. Um, and is producing, you know, product cheaper than what the small family farm cannabis farmers are able to do, um, doing it totally regenerative in a really high vibration way. So, you know, I mean, obviously with prohibition, it made sense. I mean, obviously we had to be indoors. There's no choice that that's what we need to do. And, and, and there definitely are indoor models that are better. Uh, you know, I don't want to just paint like too broad a brush, but generally speaking, it's, you know, not, not the environmental option at all. Um, and, um, you know, and so these small, so Sun and Earth basically exists to give a consumer facing standard so consumers can see on the shelf uh, cannabis that certified Sun and Earth means it's 
grown in the soil, under the sun, no chemicals, fair labor. You know, obviously we know there's all kinds of labor exploitation and, um, you know, just generally in the kind of farming sector. Um, so just to, you know, make sure that we, you know, everyone's winning with Southern Earth Cannabis, like everyone involved is getting a sustainable price, sustainable wages, safe working conditions. Yeah. Yeah, sun-grown cannabis. Um, you know, still to this day, my memories of some of the very, very best cannabis that I've ever enjoyed in my whole life was the cannabis that was being grown at, in California under the full sun in the mid to late 1970s before the helicopters came. I mean, that cannabis yeah. was so strong. I remember you could, you could open a bag in the back, back, back room of a great big house and just open it for a few minutes to roll a joint and the whole house would smell skunky. I mean, I remember picking up buds and, and the bud would be so sticky, it would stick to your hands, it would stick to your hands. Hands. phenomenal cannabis all run under the full sun of California and then of course the helicopters came and and cannabis yeah. growers were forced to go inside and over time we became pretty clever and we learned how to almost completely replicate the power of the sun indoors but it came with some really really serious environmental downsides and you know by one estimate it takes 250 pounds of coal to produce mm. the electricity that are needed to grow one pound of cannabis indoors. Or put differently, you can drive 23 miles down the highway in the average American automobile on the same amount of energy that it takes to produce one joint grown indoors. And, you know, when I learned this information for me, it was just, it was appalling, um, you know, as a people, as a tribe who is in love with a plant and, and therefore necessarily we need to be in love with nature. Um, we just can't allow cannabis to be to be produced this way. Um, it's far too environmentally destructive. And the big challenge in California has been, for a lot of reasons that are too complex to go into right now, indoor cannabis has been regarded as superior quality and mm -hmm. it's fetched a higher price. And so people who are growing cannabis in a natural way, in the soil, under the sun, uh, are, have been at a competitive disadvantage. And I think that the brilliance of sun and earth is to take this disadvantage and, and really turn it into an advantage. Because what do we know? If you take a look at tomatoes, if you take a look at, at any other vegetable crop, the very highest quality is what's grown in the soil, naturally under the sun, not hothouse tomatoes that are grown in greenhouses. And so I think it's just a genius uh, approach and, and, and a really great example of, of, of the kind of ethical approach you bring uh, to everything that you do, David. Um, let's talk a little bit about your journey and, and, and how you, you got there. You um, grew up in, in a family that was already dedicated to ethical values-based business uh, activities. But, um, but it wasn't necessarily cannabis, right? How did, how did you find your way to cannabis and the visionary plants? Yeah, well, um, uh, you know, so, so I, you know, relate my, my granddad um, and, you know, and, and just his inspiration and example, but my granddad, you know, he had immense tragedy at the ovens of the Holocaust behind him that acclaimed his parents, our, our factory in, in, Germany was Aryanized in 1940, and his parents, like a lot of bourgeois Jews, stayed until it was too late. They thought they were going to ride out the madness. And they were deported and killed. Um, and in that same time frame, and my granddad was had was a consultant of the U.S. soap industry. He came over in the late 20s. Um, he he married my grandmother Paula and had three kids, including my dad, um, 1939. And his wife Paula, my grandmother, was pretty sickly and, and was in and out of hospitals and she died in 1944. So he's going through a lot of immense personal tragedy. And, you know, his response was this amazing, like just, you know, just taking all that and just seeing this, you know, beautiful vision of humanity that could exist in, in peace and harmony and sustainable relationship with the earth and dedicated his life to that. But in doing so it was kind of uh, not the best father. Uh, and kind of basically was absent and his kids came up in a series of foster homes that um, my, um, my granddad financially supported, supported them and checked in, uh, you know, semi-regular, but it's pretty absent. And 
so my dad, you know, he, he joined the Navy when he was 17, um, spent eight years there. And then when he came out, um, he went to work with my granddad making soap in LA. Uh, my granddad was running out a reactor by that time. And um, in the early 60s, like the word was getting out. I mean, the soap was really resonating to the time, as you noted, you know, a whole generation, you know, dropping out of this culture, this war machine, this like disaster uh, on earth. Rachel Carlson, Silent Spring, it dropped. And, you know, all the pesticides that were like eradicating wildlife and, and birds and the songbirds and, you know, and, and, you know, you know, this generation that was looking to live closer to the earth, the more simple lifestyle, you know, here's a soap that is versatile, it's concentrated, biodegradable, you can wash by the side of the river, your hair, your dog, your dishes, not worry about it. And then it's got this incredible message of peace and unity. So, so things are really starting to take off. And um, but my, my dad and my granddad had a pretty fractious relationship. And um, so when my granddad moved down to North County, San Diego, to Escondido in, in mid 60s, my dad stayed up in LA and he became the head of operations at this other chemical specialty manufacturer that continued to make the soap for Dr. Bronner's, but made a bunch of other stuff, including uh, firefighting foam for, for forest and structure fires. So like I grew up helping my dad, you know, sell firefighters and using foam to, to put out fires, which is pretty standard now, but back in the eighties was like pretty revolutionary uh, uh, stuff. So, um, and my dad, he rebelled against that, you know, for, for my dad, like it's all one, you know, vision and talk of my granddad was he associated with just bailing on your family and bailing on your, your responsibilities. And so my dad was kind of, you know, Reagan Republican, you, you know, but you know, it's the most moral, giant of a man, you know, showed up for his family. He made the most beautiful family for, for me, my brother and sister and my mom, you know, him and my mom, Trudy, who's our CFO at Dr. Browner's. And my brother, Mike is our president. My brother-in-law, Michael Milam is our chief operations. Um, and, uh, and it was just the most moral giant of a man just would just show up for, for his community and volunteer and do all kinds of amazing stuff with the youth programs of the day. And, um, you know, just really set the example. Uh, and for him, you know, like he, he didn't want any God talk. He just showed up and did the right thing. And, you know, just was, so, so we really try to blend those examples of both my granddad's kind of cosmic vision of peace on earth and keeping that perspective. And then, but also my dad, like, you know, what can you show up and practically do? What are the practical leverage points to like move the ball forward? Um, and uh, so, you know, it was, you know, I guess, you know, I was raised Protestant. Um, my mom's Protestant. My dad was, as I said, pretty religious, but he did make sure I said the Shema, the central Jewish prayer in both Hebrew and English. Uh, uh, growing up, my, uh, my granddad's kind of a, 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 his translation of the Shema was, was listen, children, eternal father, eternal one. Uh, so it, it, he made a, a little more universal than the traditional Translation is hero Israel, the Lord, your father, the Lord is one. But, but the idea that all of existence, all of reality is part of the divine, and you know, like that, um, you know, just thankful for, for that. But I, I rejected my Christian faith by the time I was 13 and, you know, but wasn't really, um, and, and as far as my granddad, you know, that wasn't making sense. I mean, uh, he was just coming from the mountaintop all the time. You know, we must unite the spaceship earth. We're all one or none. You know, and as a kid, I was just like, you know, awesome, you know, I just, but not really getting it. Um, and it wasn't until college, um, you know, I, I got, uh, I went to Harvard, uh, got in early to West Point, almost did that and was getting recruited for football um, and went to Harvard, not really that academically inclined. And, um, but, uh, you know, thought maybe I'll be a doctor and took a bunch of science classes and you know, realized, well, I didn't want to do that. Um, but I was like, okay, what major has at least more things to do? And that was biology. So I was a biology major, major to, and took a bunch of electives. But by my second year, I was like kind of getting disillusioned with um, the kind of implicit scientific like reductionism and, you know, that all of human consciousness is just a, you know, epiphenomenon of physical process and evolutionary processes and nothing too special is going on around here. And, um, you know, and that was, and, and also like alcohol culture, like going to the bars and getting drunk. I was getting getting tired of that. And and my roommates, uh, Dan and Ed, you know, they were you know getting high and just listening to music and 
you know, I, I kind of got into that vibration and just was just heart and mind blown open, just in these beautiful cannabis meditations, you know, just with each other and just being silly, going deep, just drinking deep with each other of life and such a higher vibration and alcohol. And, and, you know, of course that like, woke was a huge wake up call. It's like, whoa, what the hell's wrong with the fucking the laws of this country that treats alcohol, which is clearly has way more downsides than cannabis as, you know, legal and can, you know, that, that whole waking up process. And this is, I guess, 93, you know, into 94. And, then, and I think junior year, I had my first mushroom trip. And I remember looking down at my arm and thinking, you know, wow, what does it mean at a quantum level? I'm like one with the world. There's not a difference. You know, there's no separation between me and the world. And when I eat and I poop, the world's like pouring through me and into me. And, and, and I'm in this like river cycle of the world. And I'm not even the same blood and stuff month to month. I'm like, you know, I'm like this river of energy and this like, I'm part of this living world. And it's not this dead world out there to exploit. And, and it's, it's, I'm part of it and it's all alive. And, and just having that first unity experience. Um, and I didn't really put it together with my granddad yet. And it wasn't until after college, I had a Euro pass and ended up in Amsterdam during the Cannabis Cup. The, uh, and uh, I sh- I'm going to go over and show my, I got, I got Alex, Alex and Allison Gray gave me the, one of their last prints, but I got it up on the wall here. I don't know if you remember the, uh, the goddess, right? I remember it well, yeah. Yeah, man. So she was everywhere in the city. And that was just a, a revolutionary time for me. Um, and just had some, and I ended up in a squat um Lizer Strott and Kaiser Grox and Sam Smith and just and some members from our church uh which was a church in Arkansas that had been formed in 1993 with cannabis as a sacrament to make a first like a first amendment constitutional challenge to the drug war and of course you know 1993 in Arkansas that wasn't going to work out the feds busted them up and a lot of them were in jail and a couple of the members including Sam had got out and was in my squat and, you know, and this is, I was just really, and I was having these big psychedelic openings and, and really just appreciating that this, this cannabis is a sacrament and it's the, sac, you know, it's a sacrament of our people. And then the drug war in large part is a religious war on the sacrament of our people and against the counterculture and a proxy to go after the activists and, and you know, the anti-Vietnam and other activists and, uh, you know, civil rights and otherwise in the sixties. And before that it was just a racist program to go after people of color and, just really waking up to that dimension um, of the reality of the drug war. And, um, and yeah, you know, basically dedicated my life to integrating our sacraments in, in, in as responsible way as possible. Adopted a vegan diet, you know, uh, realizing the just disaster of Western consul- consumption on the planet. We live, it's like a comet sitting the earth, going through the sixth great extinction event. And, uh, you know, and the, our agriculture is a big part of that. Um, and just the way we feed ourselves and just like making that conscious choice. And, you know, I do respect uh, conscious um, uh, pasture raised choices. If it's, a, you know, animals pasture raised and lived the life worth living and was able to fulfill its, you know, instinctual being and is a, a quick humane death, you know, that I can appreciate and respect that. But um, fortunately, 99% of meat, dairy and eggs in this country are coming from deplorable factory farm situation. And, um, but, uh, you know, but just, I, 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 and at the, at the cannabis cup, I got exposed to hemp for the first time. So it was, there's a whole hemp expo. And I was like, well, you know, at the time I'm like, well, whatever's going to help legalize, you know, cannabis, you know, and, and, and that's what all the hamsters were. I mean, Jack, I mean, we we're all about like opening up cultural space and conversation for everything about this plant, but, you know, but really getting turned on like, wow, what a miraculous plant, you know, it's incredible fiber and seed, incredible history of you know, feeding the world and, and, and clothing the world and, you know, the sales of the clipper ships and the canvas covered wagons and just the depth of history in American history. And the first law of Jamestown was you, it was illegal not to grow hemp on your farm. You had to take 10% of your farm and grow hemp. And you know, all this buried history and hemp for victory during when our hemp supply was cut off by the Japanese. Um, and we had this huge domestic hemp growing program. And, uh, so, you know, just got really fired up about hemp and um, in cannabis in general, and, you know, came back from Amsterdam after a few months. You know, I actually moved back. I was going to grow plants in Amsterdam, but things, one reason or another, I didn't quite all work out. I was a mental health counselor in the Boston Waltham area, 
uh, counseling paranoid schizophrenic populations for, for a period, doing a lot of journaling, realizing that my granddad, you know, just really getting in down with my granddad and his vision and really understanding it, which, you know, I just understood like, wow, what a unique opportunity I have. And if a company like Dr. Browners would offer me a job, I'd go for it in a second, you know, notwithstanding, you know, I hadn't, didn't want to work for my dad, not because my dad wasn't awesome, but just I wanted to, you know, do my own thing. But then I'm like, whatever, man, this is an amazing opportunity. And, and um, you know, let my dad know um, right around when the birth of my daughter um, on March 7th, 1997, and it was the same day that Dr. Bronner died. And, um, and, uh, and then my dad was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer uh, soon after that. Um, so fortunately, uh, me and my then wife, uh, uh, you know, we had made the decision to come back into the company. And, and Chris is my ex, we divorced uh, two and a half years ago. You know, fast forward, she's running our, our family foundation, focusing on migrant justice and racial justice issues. Um, it's an amazing woman. Um, but yeah, so came back when I was 24 to the family company and, and really on fire, you know, kind of like you just had gone through this, like, just, you know, fundamental, uh, you know, you know, I, one of the big psychedelic experiences I had that really, you know, set me on my path was, you know, just dying into life. I was in the, in the Matzo trans club in Amsterdam and on LSD and MDMA and, just was going through a lot. It was like a big initiation and it was like kind of going through multiple ego deaths, like dying to the concepts of gay and straight and man and woman and just all these constructs. And, and, and then understanding the way I'd been jealously hamstringing my, my partner, uh, Chris at the time. And, you know, understanding like better to be better to die and get out of her way and get out of her light, you know, but then being embraced by her into the light, which was like my own soul. Like it's, you know, and, and, and in the light and the love at the heart of reality, um, then, you know, then coming out and I'm like, holy motherfucking shit, you know, like my man is totally right, you know, wow, you know, that's, that's the ground. But then I'm like, well, what up God? Like right now I'm dancing in this club and, you know, there's rape, there's murders, all kinds of fucked up shit going on. And then getting microscoped like Job into the nothing and like just the infinite all of life, just living and dying and everything, you know, just the, the self of all and no explanation, you know, just like, I am that I am. And, but then there's Jesus kind of stepping up, like calm and compassionate, not trying to complain, not, not trying to explain it, not complaining about it, just stepping in cert, calm service. And, uh, you know, like, I want to be like that guy. And, you know, just dedicating, you know, my life to, you know, how do we just make this more awesome? And, you know, and, and I totally am on the all one path, you know, when you're ready, spirit will show up, you know, as your partner, as your child, as your father, as, you know, Jesus, as Buddha, you know, who, what, what, you know, the divine's going to meet you in, in whatever way is appropriate, uh, you know, when, when you're ready and, and completely on the all one path. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so coming in and one of the first things we did at Browner's was add hemp seed oil to the, we did some customer trials. And in 1999, added hemp seed oil because it has such a nice omega-3 content, makes the soap more emollient, lather less drying, but of course is also positioned at the nexus of drug policy reform and environmental sustainability. Um, the most ridiculous out of control example of a drug, this hysterical drug war that was schedule non-drug agricultural crop is schedule one. And so then we got in this big fight with DEA, DEA is trying to ban it. You know, and, and, you know, putting hemp on Bronner's, you know, that was back, that was like putting LSD on your label back, back then, you know, and it was like a big deal, you know, to put hemp also, oh, Bronner's putting hemp, you know, big hemp call out and, you know, opening up that space, a cultural space for cannabis. And I think we met around that time because you and Eric had founded Ecolution and met in DC and, you know, just really appreciating you and all your activism and uh, history and just, uh, you know, you know, just the same vibration and same mission and, uh, you know, supporting Asa early on, met Steph. I met her before she was even a medical cannabis activist. She actually worked with my ex, Chris, on a mayoral campaign here in San Diego. And then um, she got tackled by that marshal at the IMF protests in DC in 2002. And she was walking around with her, with her head on her net and her shoulder for like six months and cannabis healed her. And then she brought all that activism from the anti-globalization movement into cannabis. You know, so we were supporting Asa. And then, you know, the different campaigns and, 
yeah, you know, and then eventually maps and in, in one of the, you know, and when a reporter would call me back in the day about isn't hemp a stalking horse for marijuana and always like the, you know, the official answer was like, well, you know, some of us support any cannabis prohibition, but many of us don't, you know, we're in a coalition focused on hemp for fiber and seed, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the secret answer was no, get this right. This is about LSD. Uh, you know, like that's the end game. And, uh, you know, and that's where we're, you know, I think with maps and, you know, just fast forward, we're, you know, on mission here to integrate all our psychedelic allies and, um, yeah, but doing it right, like just your whole point of, of this program and what you're saying, like, how do you inspire this next generation to, you know, do business in the right way and get big like Bronner's did and but in service, like we cap, the most important thing we did is cap our salaries, like understanding like, whoa, okay, I see where we're going, but we're gonna cap our executive compensation at five times our lowest fully vested position and all profits that we don't need for the company, we dedicate to the causes and charities we believe in. And that's, I think, been crucial. Um, so just to really like, cause I could early on see how your expenditures rise to meet income, you know, the next fast, you know, better car, the next whatever house, the, the whatever, the whatever, you know, and just putting that cap and just, you know, before you're making too much and getting on that tread, you know, that whatever, you know, putting in that cap and just saying, cause it's like a lot, you know, I mean, but you know, it's all relative, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, people can live, you know, 2 million a year, uh, they're using it all, you know, it's just like, dude, you could live on 10% of that on a really beautiful way and give 90% of that and change the laws in your state to, to help, you know, millions of people, you know, so, but yeah. So you have been really incredibly successful at doing something that's extraordinarily difficult, David which is creating a successful business that also holds true to the value system that cannabis and the other visionary substances teach us. And it seems like um, there was a, a period of, of generational change that was happening at the company that may have made this transition a bit easier. But could you share with us, you know, what were the really tough moments at introducing cannabis into, into the company? Were there any you know, really challenging moments and how did you overcome them? Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, have, I mean, you know, uh, you know, when I, when I came back, you know, and announced to my family that I was a uh, vegetarian and I was going back to Amsterdam to grow plants and that we're going to, we need to end this war on cannabis and the sacrament of my people. And, you know, I was pretty alarmed my family and I think they're more upset about me becoming a vegetarian than, uh, growing cannabis. But, uh, um, yeah, so obviously they, um, they knew I was not a pure hemp advocate. Uh, so, you know, they were, had some skepticism that I had to overcome. Um, but you know, what, what we did is we just, we did blind customer trials with hemp seed oil and, um, basically did our, you know, standard browners and then just formulated with 1%, just not that much hemp seed oil. It gave so much more emolliency to the, the soap lather and less drying after fuel that it was just like a night and day. I mean, it's just very clear that hemp really improved the formula. And it's just that omega-3 and the omega-3 is, you know, it's, you know, it's, hemp is one of the very few plant-based sources of omega-3 fatty acid that's chronically deficient in the American diet. And, um, but anyways, that's how I, you know, basically was able to just kind of objectively show the um, advantages to hemp. And then, you know, and, you know, I mean, obviously we're kind of, kind of positioning the company to get into it with DEA, but, you know, honestly, Canada had just recommercialized in 98 and we thought we were going to get gore, you know, I mean, it was just such a nightmare when we got Bush, um, you know, so I honestly, I mean, we did think we were re on the cusp of recommercializing hemp, um, but then we got Bush and the whole nightmare of, of that, Nashcroft and 9-11 and him going nuts on hemp and medical marijuana and all that. So, yeah, I, I don't think my family signed up for all that, for that, all that, but you know, it actually enabled us to really cut our teeth, you know, fighting the DEA, you know, and in that time, you know, it was nuts and like very stressful, but we got this crash course on administrative law and just how to, you know, how to beat, the, beat them at their own game. And uh, yeah, and just really set us up for future success. So I remember these years of struggle um, very well. Uh, this was when we were, we were working to build a legal hemp industry in the United States. 
And the DEA was so threatened by the idea that there would be any form of legal cannabis in any variety whatsoever that they came up with the most insane regulatory and administrative blockades. Uh, and there was a whole series of battles that were fought by David, that were fought by people who were making uh, cannabis food products uh, in order to have some kind of ability to import hemp into the United States, um, even though we couldn't grow it here. And so I remember those those battles well, and they were they were definitely a you know a, a trying time. I can imagine, um, I can imagine some of those family conversations. So, yeah, totally, man. And, and to your point, right? I mean, DEA. I mean, that, you know, the official propaganda in line was cannabis was a plant with roots in hell with no redeeming social value whatsoever. So contradicting that, you know, obviously was threatening their whole you know house of cards. Um, which, you know, you saw, we saw, I mean, it was all about, you know, just like, oh, wait, actually cannabis is awesome in this way and that way and another way, you know? And yeah, I mean, they were right. Of course, that's what the game was about. But we played it pretty straight, so, yeah. Yep. yep, and the walls are tumbling down and they continue to tumble down all around the world. You know, yeah. in the early years of the cannabis reform movement, we took our stand on the grounds of personal freedom uh, on the idea that nobody had the right to tell us what we could put into our bodies, particularly something that was not harmful. And that philosophy didn't really get us too far. By the 1980s in the United States, we were, we were really you know, on the run. The cannabis reform movement was in a defensive posture. And the way that we ultimately turned it around was largely due to the contributions of two men, Jack Herrer, who taught us about industrial hemp and its potential to save the world, save the planet, and Dennis Perone, who really mm -hmm. gave us an, a, a real life example of the power of cannabis medicine to save lives during the height of the AIDS crisis in San Francisco. Uh, so that ability to tell the full story about cannabis, I think has been a key to successful reform. And, and when activists from around the world ask me what I think is, is important. That's what I say, to tell the full story, the whole story of this plant and how valuable it can be in so many different ways. No, 100%, but I wanna shout out yourself and all your, you know, some amazing contributions and activism and, you know, it's, it's been just, you know, from the yippies and all the activism in DC and Ford, you've been there maneuvering and helping carry the torch through those really dark days and the, 80s and 90s and you know by the time i came in you and you guys had lit in a huge fire you know so you know thank you and everybody should read uh, smoke signals by martin lee to get the full story it's a rip and read and you can just read all about the history of prohibition and it's and the end of prohibition and all all of, all of your exploits which are which are amazing no. well, Thanks for that appreciation, David. You know, one of the things that's become clear over time is that the cannabis reform movement is and must continue to be a multi-generational movement. We still have a lot of work to do. We've, we've made a lot of progress in the course of my lifetime, but I think it's going to take a few more generations to get us all the way where we want to be to make sure that everybody around the world who needs this plant has it. So, yeah. um, you know, woven into your cannabis story, as it's woven into my cannabis story, is the um, is is this other thread of other visionary uh, substances and visionary plants. And I like to think of cannabis as being Mother Nature's most gentle and forgiving plant teacher. But the experience of of many of us, um, you and me, has been that. Um, once introduced to, to the wisdom of visionary substances, we've sought out more and, and deepened our learning and deepened our understanding and, and, and strengthened our value system. So could you talk a little bit about the efforts that MAPS is making right now? And, um, and you know, what really interests me about what MAPS is doing is, um, you know, there's this... Um, tension, I think, between the lessons that visionary plants teach us about um, not, um, not accruing more than we need and leaving a gentle footprint on Mother Earth and sharing with everybody 
who needs and the imperatives of a for-profit um, market. And now we're beginning to see um, a lot of companies that are starting to talk about for-profit psychedelic products, services, various different kinds of plays. MAPS is taking a, a kind of interesting approach in that, in that regard. Could you talk a little bit about what MAPS is doing with MDMA? Yeah, so, you know, Rick Doblin is, uh, you know, just a, just a Jedi hero. Um, He's, uh, you know, this, his, he was part of this underground therapeutic community in the late 70s and early 80s that had really experienced the healing power of MDMA as an adjunct to therapy, to talk therapy and just helping people process, you know, deep trauma and, you know, very difficult relationship issues. And, um, you know, this is an amazing tool. And when the DEA scheduled uh, MDMA, I think it was in 84, um, this was, uh, you know, I mean, you know, MDMA got out. It became a party drug, I guess, of all places in Dallas, Texas, uh, in the cowboy bar scene. Um, but, uh, you know, but then, you know, kind of migrated and influenced house culture up in Chicago and Detroit, and then the Summer of Love back in London, and, you know, and this the whole birth of rave. Um, but, uh, but Rick founded MAPS in the year that DEA scheduled MDMA, and with the intent to um, basically, you know, bring MDMA and other psychedelic medicine into the culture and mainstream it through FDA approval process, which just sounded crazy, um, you know, especially in that time. But even in the darkest days of the drug war, he was just making progress and just making these unusual allies at high levels of government and getting studies approved by FDA uh, to show first the safety of MDMA. Um, but, you know, and then, and then eventually the, the benefit, uh, especially for treatment resistant PTSD. Um, and, you know, it's just been a Jedi magician uh, on, working on the system and bringing together a, just a real unusual coalition. And, you know, really, um, I mean, drug policy reform has always been a, a coalition of left progressive and right libertarian. Um, but, you know, Rick's just, you know, and then I think part of his genius is seeing that and, and, and his expressed desire is to heal the cultural split of the 60s by taking the medicine of the counterculture to heal the trauma of our veterans, you know, and just like kind of take us into this, you know, a new realm, a new world that can be a much more peaceful and harmonious place. I mean, notwithstanding our current administration, uh, hopefully we'll sweep him away. You know, at the same time, we're bringing our medicines in and just turning psychedelically healing and opening everybody at a, a whole other dimension. Of, uh, of being, you know, a psychedelically open citizenry. Hopefully, we'll be enacting a lot more compassionate policies. And um, but but Maps is, you know, just uh, Rick is firmly believes in the nonprofit model. Uh, he's not opposed to for profits, and obviously, Bron is an example of a social venture for profit that's uh, uh, you know ethical and doing um, you know everything in a in a cool way. And there's certainly example of nonprofits that are really you know, bad and, and not doing that much good. Um, but nonetheless, you know, is, is committed to this nonprofit pharma vision um, and the and the subsidiary, the for-profit subsidiary, the MAPS Benefit Corp is organized as a benefit corporation, just like Dr. Bronner's. Um, and yeah, it's just basically got an incredible talented team of uh, rock stars um, that really understand pharmaceutical drug development, but are utilizing their skills for the good uh, and want to and are doing so. And, um, you know, just making this, uh, this entity that, you know, once we do MDMA, you know, M Ibogaine or, you know, other, other incredible allies that have such potential, you know, Ibogaine has such potential to heal up opiate addiction. You know, it's a very intense psychedelic, but um, actually will interrupt opiate withdrawal and, and enable a person to be free of the physical craving and also really do a lot of the psychological work to work on those underlying issues that led to the addict addiction in the first place. Um, although there's no magic bullets, uh, you know, you need to be doing the work on your fitness and your diet and your everything else and meditation um, for, for that, for the medicine to truly work. But, you know, the medicine is just able to come in and just really give you a, a, a real shot at, at deep healing. And we're, and we're seeing just miraculous stories. And with veterans, you're, you see 22 veteran suicides a day, far more veterans have taken their life than have died in, in Afghanistan and Iraq um, by, by, by their own hands. 
And this is a completely preventable situation. Um, we're, we're showing that we have the medicine and the therapy that can heal this up. And it's not just MDMA, you know, ayahuasca, psilocybin, um, you know, psilocybin's moving through FDA approval process for treatment resistant depression. And these are kind of the boxes that we need to, you know, the way our system's designed. But these medicines are for everybody and we're all on the spectrum of, of everything and all suffering with the dilemmas and slings and arrows of life. So, you know, the, the, the end game here is to make these medicines available to everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's other strategies. There's decriminalized nature that's, that's moving. There's an organ psilocybin therapy measure that we're backing uh, that will open up psilocybin therapy to everybody and kind of outside the medical pharma model. Um, but, but yeah, MAPS is a, just, it's a beautiful engine. And hopefully the profits that we get from MDMA, well, for sure the profits, you know, MDMA is not, it's not gonna be a price gouging kind of scenario, but we'll generate profits to continue the mission uh, of uh, integrating other medicines into society. And Rick's got a vision of bringing cannabis through FDA approval process so that we can get cannabis covered by insurance companies. Cause right now that's unfortunately there's no way to have it paid, your medicine paid for, even though it's obviously the best medicine uh, versus you know, all these pharmaceuticals that are insurable. So, uh, but yeah, so, so MAPS is doing all kinds of good stuff. There are, uh, there's so much about MAPS that impresses me, but for the purposes of this conversation, um, what really strikes me is that MAPS has now created a for-profit company that is going to work at making MDMA available to people for therapeutic purposes. But that for-profit company is entirely controlled by the MAPS nonprofit entity. And so Rick is blending the strengths of free enterprise with some of the more values centric ethics of the nonprofit. And again, like so much of the work that, that you've done, David, like the work that I've strived to do, it's all about finding a way to use the power of the marketplace, to use the power of entrepreneurship uh, in order to move forward the values and the changes that, that we want to see. Um, let's pivot a little bit and, and talk about this thing that I'm referring to as the, the, the global cannabis reform movement, um, or when I get more poetic about it, I talk about the, the one cannabis tribe. Um, mm. How, I, uh, we, we talked a little bit about your experiences in, in Amsterdam. Have you had other opportunities to engage around the world with the cannabis community? Um, you know, I guess, um, I mean, you know, I mean, cannabis is my number one daily ally and, and, you know, it's my go-to and just keeps me in check and gives me so much, uh, help and wisdom and insight, um, and good times. But, um, you know, I mean, it comes with me wherever I go in the world. Uh, and I, you know, like to enjoy cannabis wherever I go in the world with, uh, with all my one tribe members. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, I guess politically, I, you know, we haven't really activated in, a, in political support per se. I mean, I know, you know, that Spain's working hard. They've got their cannabis club model and, um, yeah, and you know, I'm just psyched to see Mexico uh, liberalizing and Canada and, um, oh, I guess we did have a hand in, in the UK. Um, you may have remember there is a, well, I don't know how much press it got over here, but in the UK, there was a kid, Billy Caldwell, and he had had a childhood epileptic seizure disorder. And his mother was going to Canada to get the CBD, the life-saving medicine for her son. And, um, uh, and Graham Boyd, who runs the new approach pack, you know, let me know like, hey, this lady, this mother is ready to go to the mat and like go be public and break the law and commit civil disobedience, you know, not just go sneak her medicine, in, but actually be public about it. And, you know, and create a, a, a you know, crisis, you know, in, in the government. And you should just, you know, the, in this nonprofit just needs 30 grand to like kind of set everything in motion. And so, uh, you know, we made that contribution. You know, we, we kept ourselves out of it. And, um, and indeed she went, you know, got the medicine, came back, you know, all the media was invited out, out as she came publicly holding her life-saving medicine for her son. She was arrested at Heathrow and, um, or not, or whatever the London airport is. Uh, is that right? 
I don't know. Um, but yeah, yeah. But she was she was arrested and just triggered this massive conversation. Like overnight, the government, you know, formed a commission to study medical cannabis and you know reform laws. I mean, still like pretty not the best. You know, it's like you got to have these narrow set of qualifying conditions. I think it's improving, but you know, from total draconian prohibition, which I didn't realize. I didn't realize how backward the UK was uh, on cannabis policy. But um, so, you know, it's just one of those things like, you know, just that, you know, just have an opportunity to be able to throw some fuel at a key moment on something. Um, and that was able to really trigger that kind of conversation. Um, I mean, whatever, we were indirect. I mean, we didn't have much to do with it, but just were able to do some, throw some support and help the activists there, you know, make the change happen. Well, thank you for that good work. And, you know, I think that that's a great example of, of what I'm now calling the global cannabis freedom movement. You know, for a long, long time as a movement, we were confined to particular states or to particular countries. We had our hands so full, just opening up a little bit of a room of freedom. But now in some parts of the world, in California, you know, for example, We've had legal cannabis in some form for 25 years. There's a lot of young people uh, who are alive today who never even grew up with total cannabis prohibition. And we have organizations like MAPS, we have companies like Dr. Bronner's who have had an opportunity to expand into this space, to learn some lessons, to develop some connections and to assemble some resources. And now what we're seeing uh, around the world is other countries, Mexico, Colombia, Jamaica, Spain, India. I just heard about medical cannabis laws being passed in Lebanon. Africa wow. is, starting to, is starting to come to life. Uh, and it's one of the largest cannabis consuming continents in the world. And so the spark that we lit here in California, uh, almost 30 years ago now, has spread all around the world. And one of the hopes of this community that we're building here on Radio Free Cannabis is that we can find more ways to help so that we increase these dialogues, uh, that we put activists from one country in touch with activists from another country, that we can tell each other's styles, stories, and share each other's styles and, mm -hmm. and teach each other how to accelerate this movement and, and bring it uh, all over the world. Um, David, I know there's a, um, uh, you know, like, like when I was a young person, there's um, millions of young people who love this plant, who are trying to find a way through the world that's consistent with their value system. What advice would you have for, for those young people? Any ideas you have on how they can, can achieve some of the, that balanced life that you've been so successful in achieving? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, as far as like legal, where, where cannabis is legal, I mean, setting up uh, ethical, you know, social venture uh, companies, where you just kind of build um, the ethics right into the business model itself. Um, that, you know, kind of that's what we're able to do at Bronner's and Maps is doing. And, and there's quite a few other companies, you know, really setting the example of uh, just kind of pricing into your product. Um, you know, uh, some amount of revenue, even if it's just 1%, like you dedicate to activism I and mean, 1% of revenue, that's a lot. You know, it's like 10% of your, if you're making 10% profit, that's 10% of your profit. Um, so, you know, just, just things like that. And, um, and then, yeah, I mean, where it's not legal yet. Yeah. Just uh, engaging, you know, with uh, organizations or forming organizations, learning uh, from organizations like ASA and MPP and normal and, um, just how to how to go about it, how to affect the change, you know, lobby your officials and governments. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, just be smart activists, activists and advocates. But then, yes, also like leverage the market, you know, setting up these social ventures. I mean, that's, um, it's, it's great because you can generate profit um, that can, you know, when you're looking at money as energy and, you know, it's just, it's neutral, it's amoral. And you can just be con consciously deploy it and just make some big differences with not that much. So, so yeah, let's do it. 
Yeah. Yes, definitely. Let's do it. So um, I wonder, is there going to be a time that we'll be able to invite you to come out and meet some of this global community, maybe come to Mexico and Colombia and Jamaica and share some of this wisdom that you've accrued? You been to doing that? Oh, yeah, of course, man. Yeah. Now I get down to Mexico for one reason or another. And in fact, I was down with the Native American church visiting the Raradica, the Huichol, on a peyote preservation pro project. Um, but yeah, the cannabis community, let's, let's, let's link up. All right. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we feel really um, uh, very fortunate to have you and to have your example, David. And uh, I and I know that, that all the listeners of this podcast wish you the very best in continuing to to move this example forward and and really you know help teach us how we can actually realize the promise of legal cannabis and now of other legal visionary substances to create the kind of world that we want to live in and to enable us to live lifestyles that that lead us in that direction so we appreciate you very much and thank you yeah, likewise, CV. Thank you for leading the way and blazing the path and setting the example. Yeah, we're, we're all lighting the torch for each other. Light, light each other on fire. So, thank you. Yes, brother. Always onward, forever free. Yeah. Let's do it. All, right. all one. Yeah. So, friends, we are uh, wrapping up here another episode of Radio Free Cannabis. I hope that you found some of the subject matter that we've covered, some of the lessons that we've talked about valuable. You know, there's a, a huge promise that's offered now by the legal cannabis industry and, and hopefully by other legal distribution of other visionary substances. These plants and these substances that lead us to a new way of living that help strengthen our value system, that help teach us the methods that we need in order to get to the world that we really all most want to be in. But that promise, that promise is not an easy promise to realize. When you enter the realm of business, when you enter the realm of capitalism, you also enter a, a battlefield. And, uh, and a lot of what happens there is dependent on regulators, is dependent on competitors. And it takes a really strong internal moral compass it takes a great deal of resilience. It takes a great deal of determination in order not to be thrown off course, in order to actually be able to realize this promise of doing well and doing good at the same time. So I wish all of you who are on your beginning stages of that journey success. Uh, take each step carefully. Think about each job that you take, each business venture that you create uh, very carefully. And from time to time, be sure to go out, sit underneath a tree, fire up a joint, and talk to the birds about what you're doing. See what they have to say about it.